Hi, I'm Walimu DeLuca, and I'm going to talk about 10 things you need to know about refugees from the lens of anthropology. I'm an anthropologist, and I first started working with refugees in the year 2000 when a group of Sudanese refugee young men, so-called lost boys, named by humanitarian workers lost boys after Peter Pan's orphans. Um, this group came to Denver and I met them at the Boulder Public Library and started to get interested, started to teach about refugees, taught what is the what, and then really got interested in the young women who also arrived. So with the lost girls, there were only 89 girls who came to the U.S. as resettled refugees and nearly 4,000 men who were unaccompanied minors. It was a question that was asked in class to me was why so few women and so many men? And that got me curious and led to writing the book Lost Girl Found with Leah Bassoff. I also worked with post-conflict development in South Africa using the term of Ubuntu with a group to have an indigenous term that had meaning about peace building. How do we build peace in post-conflict situations like Rwanda? So we wrote together peace from within, peace building in post-colonial Africa. In 2019, I had the opportunity to work with a young entrepreneur, Essie Nakajigo, living in the face of trauma was the project in Bidi Bidi, which is, was at one point the largest refugee camp in the world. It's a settlement in northwest Uganda, and we looked at participatory action research, trying to understand the needs of youth in that camp. The first thing you need to know about refugees is the definition of a refugee. And basically a refugee is someone who's fleeing persecution. They're unwilling or unable to return to their country of origin due to a number of factors. One really important thing for refugees is that they must cross a border. If they don't cross a border, they're considered an IDP or an internally displaced person. So the definition of a refugee really comes out, it's defined by the UN in 1951. And think about what was happening in history at that time. We're ending World War II, there's been the Holocaust, and so the term refugee was really applied largely to European refugees fleeing from that post-World War II situation. So number two, refugees are one of a type of forced migrant. There are also asylees, they're immigrants, they're internally displaced people. So refugees are a particular subcategory. And as anthropologists, we're always interested in looking at what's the difference between a refugee and an immigrant, what kind of situations and history and cultural factors led to that. So those are the kinds of things we'll be unpacking, but it's important to know that a refugee is one of many types of forced migrants. Number three, a couple interesting facts about refugees. There are about 70 million refugees worldwide currently, and that number is continuing to grow with conflict with global warming, with climate issues. World Refugee Day is June 20th every year, and it's a day of awareness around refugee issues because the general population doesn't always know that much. This is another interesting kind of fun fact. Many refugees globally have January 1st as their birthday because if they don't know what day they were born, when they're accepted into the system, the UN gives them January 1st as kind of an arbitrary birthday. So at least in the Sudanese community and even in the Bhutanese refugee community I've worked with, there are a lot of birthdays celebrated on the first of the year. So number four, from an anthropology perspective, it's important to know there are a lot of global humanitarian actors working with refugees. And again, we wanna look at that through the cultural lens, issues of power, issues of control, who's in charge of what, how does that get broken down. One of the biggest actors is the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, UNHCR, but they actually don't serve refugees directly. They're an umbrella organization that oversees refugee services. Much of the work on the, the ground is done by nonprofit organizations. Another big international actor is the IRC, the um, International Rescue Committee, but also local governments are making decisions. For example, where I've worked in Uganda, they host one of the highest number of refugees in the world. 
and they have a strong policy of welcoming in refugees, letting them move freely, letting them get jobs, uh, giving them land. And so each place is different. So there's a consortium of global actors, local actors, international NGOs, faith-based FBOs are also another really big factor. So number five, the UN, the United Nations, has three durable solutions. So why do we care as anthropologists? We need to try and understand refugees that have arrived in the United States, for example, are only one of the particular solutions that the UN's looking at. And there are many people who are stateless, who are searching for a home. So their first solution is repatriation. Why isn't that always possible? Because if the country they're fleeing from or being persecuted by is still in conflict or there's still persecution going on, that's not an option to return there. So that's called repatriation one. The second one is host country integration. So with groups I've worked with, such as the Sudanese refugees in Kakuma refugee camp or Bidi Bidi in Uganda, integrating into the local society, it really depends on how welcomed you are because Kenya has its own problems. It has its own issues with unemployment, uh, trying to serve its own people. So there is some tension about bringing in newcomers. Kakuma refugee camp, for example, is on the land of indigenous people, the Turkana, who in some ways resent that land, which was arid land, being given to the refugee camp. So as anthropologists, we're always going a little deeper than just the official story and trying to understand what's happening on the ground. The third solution is resettlement. And we focus really heavily on resettlement because those refugees are, you know, this course is going to be looking at the United States and, and it will be looking more globally, but what is it like to resettle? And that's one of the smallest of the solutions, less than 1%, because it's really expensive. And there are a lot of cross-cultural debates. Are you going to be happier as a refugee in Australia, UK, Norway, now Brazil, Chile, some um, new players are coming onto the scene, or would you be happier in a country a little bit more similar to what you're used to? So there are a lot of issues with acculturation to unpack cross-cultural sides. Number six, there are a whole host of national organizations who focus on refugees in the United States. There are 10, almost all of them are represented in Washington, D.C. They're the ones that resettle refugees throughout the country. They're called VOLAGs, Voluntary Agencies, VOLAG, B-O-L-A-G. But they're also faith-based organizations. For example, one will be learning more about in the Denver area, in the Aurora areas, called Casa del Paz, and they were featured on NPR because they're welcoming in asylees from the ICE facility in Aurora. So there's a whole host of characters, and trying to understand and map that out is really important. So number seven, there's a very complex selection process to become a refugee, and we'll be diving deeper into that but one thing to know about that that's really important is um, that anthropologists care a lot about our language. Language, time, space, and like the spaces of where refugees are, where they move to, but also language ability. So if you're being interviewed in English as a Sudanese refugee or a Bhutanese refugee and it's not your first language, you have to tell a compelling story. So the better storyteller you are, the better you grasp of language you have, the more likely you are to be successful. So there are a lot of factors. And contrary to public opinion, many refugees um, actually are highly educated and bring a lot of entrepreneurial skills because they've been forced to move and they're very adaptable. Number eight, mental health is a really big issue for refugees and also for those hosting refugees. So refugees flee persecution, they flee war, they flee genocide and very often have what Westerners might frame as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, PTS. Um, but these ideas don't neatly translate always into Western terms. And so for those working with refugees to be most efficacious, trying out different kinds of therapies like traditional therapy along with perhaps somatic therapy has been found to be very efficacious, dance, cooking together, community, not talking about the negative, not talking about um, asking questions about bad things that happened in the past that can re-traumatize. There's very often also a sense of survivor's guilt. So refugees are continuing to get 
phone calls from camp or settlement saying, you know, we need money for school fees, we need money, have you forgotten about us, we need money for health fees, uh, you're living well where you are, and remittances, which I'll talk about later, are a big factor, sending money back, but it can also trigger survival's guilt of why did I get to leave when somebody else had to stay. One organization I'd like to highlight in Guvuya, Africa with Claudine Magisha, who's actually been to ANTH 4180, works with refugees and traumatized women in the Democratic Republic of Congo, even IDPs, and does a lot with um, her own somatic healing was through dance. And so teaching that as a technique, not just dance for the sake of dance, but therapeutic dance to remain positive and productive and deal with things like PTSD. Going to therapists is also something that happens, but there's a cross-cultural dimension to that that needs to be considered. Number nine is that a lot of refugee experiences have been documented in ethnographies, and that's really the anthropology view, which doesn't just look at the global institutions, but what is it like for refugees themselves? I really love this book, The Displaced, because it's voices of refugees and the, the editor is a refugee himself from Vietnam, so all the essays, refugee writers on refugee lives. This is what we call in anthropology an emic or insider view. It can be very strong in giving that local experience, but it doesn't always bring um, theory or a larger perspective, it just depends. But these kinds of books tend to look at issues of economics, remittances, the impact that refugees have when they send money back to their home country. Again, most, many anthropological ethnographies are outsider perspectives, but they bring a theoretical dimension. And more and more we also have anthropologists who might have been refugees themselves. So you'll, you'll get to know more about that, books about working in you know, meat factories, getting stuck in low paid jobs, why that happens. So look for um, an upcoming video, 10 ethnographies you should know about. So for number 10, I'm gonna talk about food and refugee identity. There are really countless number of things you should know about. But one of the reasons I chose food, actually in my classes we have a refugee ethnographic dinner where each student brings in a dinner from the country that they're focusing on or the refugee group that they're focusing on. If they're looking at global organizations, we, we get creative and figure something out. But food is a really important piece of identity. Um, it's something that can make people feel really comfortable. In the Denver area where I live, Aurora is known for having a lot of global ethnic grocery stores that bring in spices and foods that are familiar and very comforting. We've taken a trip to the Mango House in Aurora, which has stands and food from different refugees where they're also able to earn income by selling that food. So it's got like an economic piece as well. I hear in Buffalo, New York, I haven't had a chance to go there yet. I was supposed to go um, to the West Side Bazaar, but it's got food from Somali and Bhutanese and Thai and, Vietnam, so um, food is a really key part of refugee identity. So I would say a fun fact about refugees and diversity within the state of Colorado is that Aurora is more than half the size of Denver, but not nearly as well known. It's got approaching 400,000 people, whereas Denver has about 700,000. And extremely diverse, lots of refugees. There are also refugees working throughout the state and in all, you know, many um, smaller cities as well, particularly in um, meat factories, a number in Greeley and other places. Aurora is a really unique and interesting place that doesn't always get the attention it deserves and probably one of the best places if you're a foodie and you like global food, I would say it's one of the hot spots. Another interesting factor to know about is that in 2016 there were close to 90,000 refugees, about 85,000, and the number reached historic lows down to 30,000 in 2019. Typically refugees have been welcomed in in a very bipartisan way, but there's been a lot of political turmoil. Recently there was also a ban on Muslims 
So that, you know, there's been a lot of debate about refugees and hoping that that, um, under the, the upcoming administration, there's supposed to be a big expansion. So there's constant shift and change. Thank you so much for watching this episode on 10 things you need to know. Please check out all the additional materials that we have below. Thank you so much.